So, Orapin, maybe I introduce you shortly, and then we would start with you. Orapin uh, is a journalist by training, now a project manager of ILaw, a platform for law amendment in Thailand, focusing on human rights law. She's using new media to encourage and empower the newer generations in laws and policies for the purposes of promoting democratic and social reforms and increased protection of human civil and community rights in Thailand. Orapi, please, okay. your input. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about Thailand's situation. Uh, that in Thailand, the threat to press freedom came from both state and private sector, private interests. Uh, significant obstacles of, uh, to freedom of expression include legislative problems, arbitrary detention, internet censorship, and self-censorship. I will start with Thai law. The Thai Penal Code is a major obstacle to freedom of expression. Section 112, someone may ever heard, Section 112 of the Penal Code, uh, or we call it as the Les Majeste Law, states that anyone who defames the king, the queen, and the heir would be punished for 3 to 15 years. But what the Thai authority considered to the word def defaming is very ambiguous. In the name of love for the king and the nation, and in the name of national security, the Thai authority, the Thai authority arbitrarily detained people uh, who tried to criticize to the king's role in politics. The wackiness of this law has made Thai people live under a state of fear. Further, most of less majestic cases were not granted bail. The latest verdict of less majestic case were delivered to an editor of a political magazine. He was sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment for publishing two articles, which were, uh, which were historical fictions. The issue of punishment of anyone who defames the king was also pushed into other laws related to freedom of expression. Importantly, one of it is the Computer Related Crime Act or Cyber Crime Act. The Thai authority used computer related crime law to suppress on over 10,000 internet URL per year. Or, and more than 75% of those URL had content that might insult to the king. The, wa the Wagyu definition and the harsh punishment and the denial of bail have created an atmosphere of self-censorship self in Thai society. Um, in addition to the law, I want to point out the problem with the Thai media. In particularly, I will be talking about the big gap between professional media and non-mainstream media. The law has created an atmosphere of self-censorship, which also stimulates those who, who are keen to criticize and access to information to act, to act as a citizen reporters or blogger. But the Thai professional media usually feel that this group of people cannot be categorized as a as a media, as a real media. There is also a discourse that professional media have higher responsibility than independent media. The Thai media also judge each other for their political views. And it can be said that the most professional media are quite conservative, while the ind independent media uh, ones are quite wary. The case that I had mentioned about the editor who was punished for 10 years in imprisonment was ignored by professional media society because the magazine he edited for, uh, the magazine he working for is support to a political standpoint rather than try to act as a neutral media. That is another interesting example which just happened in Thailand this week, just last week and, and until this week. 
uh, a TV news program was suppressed because a guest who frequently criticized to Thai monarchy was invited to the program. And the interesting point was no authority had put pressure on this, on this program, but it was media itself that didn't allow their program to continue airing. In my opinion, the law and its enforcement cannot be never be perfect. The strength of the media, the strength of the media society is the key, the key to freedom of expression. And in Thailand, it should start from reducing bias uh, that held against each other and keeping to the basic principle to freedom of expression. Thank you very much, Arpin. Okay, after this very interesting input uh, from Asia, and I'm sure that Matthias will do a replica once we are through on this, um, we move to Eastern Europe, and maybe I start out uh, with Norbert, who is sitting right next to me here, Norbert Palfi. After graduating university in Budapest, he started his career in advertising as a copywriter, and later creative director working in different fields of marketing communication. He joined Milla, which is in short for one million for the freedom of the Hungarian press movement, in 2011 as a volunteer activist working on communication, developing creative content, identity and communication strategy and has been deeply involved in the Miller movement since as a specialist for creating a strategy for powerful manifestations and demonstrations and I must say I was lucky enough to be a witness to this on the 23rd of October in Budapest, witnessing one of those demonstrations that uh, you are organizing in the Miller movement. And um, we're going to actually also speak on Sunday more, more deeply about this. But uh, I think the way you organize demonstration and manifestation in Hungary seems really, at least in my point of view, something well, almost like, like a model in the way you can move and get a message across, but it's your turn now to speak about this. Excuse me, please. Norbert. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we are the people who can make huge demonstrations. Uh, this is the beginning uh, of my speech all the time about Mill. Uh, there's approximately 20 slash 40 people who are working uh, on these uh, demonstrations which are held uh, basically twice a year and we have other uh, little demonstrations as well. But uh, uh, for the first, uh, in the first round I would, I would like to talk about uh, well, somehow we should uh, uh, connect uh, freedom of uh, press to Mila. Mila was um, uh, founded uh, basically as a joke on, on Facebook uh, and it was the, under the name One Million for, for the Freedom of Press. And uh, at the end of 2010, and uh, in the beginning, in, 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 in uh, the winter of, uh, in the beginning of uh, 2011, uh, there, was, um, there were two uh, little demonstrations and in the fifth, uh, on the 15th of March, there was the first huge demonstration of Milo. And what was very interesting for all of us that uh, it was uh, these demonstrations for freedom of press was, uh, were covered the least in the Hungarian media. Uh, and it was very clear that uh, <clears throat> Facebook as a media and uh, the blogging society uh, uh, were uh, helping us to 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 spread out uh, the information, which was a little bit uh, um, uh, strange. It was a little bit strange that uh, uh, the former media uh, um, feared so much that they cannot uh, um, cover Mila as it is. Um, uh, anyway, um, somehow I, I, I feel that maybe it's very important that uh, after the, the, um, from the beginning of uh, uh, this political system from 2008, there was a very strong threat around uh, the country, either uh, or either on uh, social level and uh, or both on social level and 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 professional level. That's why uh, criticism of the um, the ruling party and government was very little in the beginning. 
And Mila was a uh, one of the uh, um, interesting tool or or uh, um, the the. Um, the, the case where people understood that they are not alone criticizing the government, but there are lots of other people. This is for the beginning. Thank you. Thank you for the input, Norbert. And yes, thank you very much. I bring over maybe a little chair for you. Ah, oh, there is over. Hey, great. Now, Nuria, <coughs> Nuria Fatichkova, who has visited us for the first time last year then still a freelance journalist um, coming actually from Siberia, from Chelyabinsk, then now living in Moscow. Uh, she has worked for several uh, German magazines, online and offline, from Moscow. Um, and now she has been joining the Heinrich Böll Foundation as a coordinator of our Moscow office. Please, Nuria. Thank you. Es ist ein kleiner Kommentar zu Matthias' äh, Vortrag. The um, speech that Matthias gave. Uh, ich mag äh, sehr gerne über die Medien sprechen, die einfach Menschen gegeben wurden, um diese Welt zu verstehen. I'm going to speak a little bit about media that were given to people to make them understand the world a bit better. Das sind, wir können sehen, so bewegen, sprechen, kommunizieren. Hören. We have all our senses, like being able to see, speak, listen. Uh, und ein Journalist, oh, nicht nur, natürlich jeder aus uns, aber auch Journalist braucht diese Medien besonders. Every single one of us, but journalists in particular, need all those different media every day. Aber im 2012 in Russland beobachten wir eine komische Situation, dass russische Gesetzgebung versucht genau diese menschlichen Medien zu ver äh, verhindern. But in 2012 in Russia we had the dramatic situation that the Russian government is trying to take away those human media from people. Um, so ist das äh, es kamen also beim, beim Leben gerufen viele Gesetze. Ich nenne einige Beispiele. Um, this was because different laws were introduced and I'm going to give you a few examples. Uh, was um das Medium bewegen uh, geht. Uh, zum Beispiel vor kurzem kam ein Gesetzprojekt, der russische Bürger uh, verbietet, ohne Anmeldung frei im Land zu bewegen und leben uh, und übernachten dort, wo der Mensch will. So, for instance, concerning the medium of movement or the right of movement, there was a law introduced that prohibits Russian citizens from moving freely inside the country and staying overnight, for instance, in other places without registering um, that beforehand. Um, verboten ist auch zum Beispiel, wenn eine Gruppe plötzlich auf dem Platz tanzen beginnt. It is also not allowed, for instance, to start dancing with a group of people in public. Uh, seit langem ist schon verboten, uh, sich frei zu sammeln. There has been uh, no right of free assembly or demonstration for quite some time now. Uh, eine frische Beispiel habe gestern in der in eine russische Zeitung gelesen. In Moskau Gebiet wurde verboten bei äh, bei den Denkmal sich zu sammeln. There was just an example in the newspaper, a major Russian newspaper yesterday, that people were not allowed to gather in front of a historical monument. Und das geht nicht um die große Gruppen, sondern auch um die kleine. Und das heißt, ihr oder Sie mit Freunden wollen so ein paar Stunden bei dem Denkmal äh, ver äh, verbringen. Und das kann aber Konsequenzen darauf können die Polizei sein und Festnahmen. So we're not talking about like a mass demonstration, hundreds of people, but it's really like about the smallest of groups. So just you and your friends basically wanting to perhaps hang hang out by this monument for a few hours, which would not be allowed and will probably have consequences of police coming and possibly arresting people. Was direkt gegen Journalisten äh, benutzt sein kann und schon aktiv benutzt, das ist äh, gesetzt äh, über die Verlödung oder gegen Verlödung, äh, wie uh, Slander. Slander, ja. Yeah. Um, und auch Extremismus. Um, um, a, a law that's already being put in effect against journalists is our laws um, about slander, so um, saying bad things about other people, and um, so, 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 so,
Extremismus? An Extremism. Und es gibt aber gleichzeitig keinen Gesetz, der direkt äh, die journalistische Tätigkeit äh, angreift. So, these are not um, uh, laws that outright attack journalism or the press, but they do that in a more subversive kind of way. Das heißt, die Journalisten können schreiben, was sie wollen, Journalisten und Blogger, aber dann, was, die Situation im Land ist so, dass muss man immer über die, auch an die Konsequenzen denken. So, you know, in theory people can write about what they want, but in practice you always have to think about the consequences of what you're publishing. Und Konsequenzen sind sehr interessant. Ich nenne einige Beispiele. And these consequences are quite interesting. I'll name a few examples. Uh, Im 2012 uh, uh, Angriffe an Journalisten sind so, oder man kann einige, sorry, uh, sagen wir so, uh, die Journalisten äh, haben gelitten erstens von, oder es ist die populärste Methode, Androhungen oder ich... Äh threats. It's the genau. most popular method is uh, threats, just basically threats against journalists. Bekannt ist äh, 69 Fälle, dass die Journalisten, die, so ich weiß nicht, und das geht eigentlich in unterschiedliche Weise, auf in unterschiedliche Weise. So for instance, 2012 there were 69 cases of threats against journalists in different kinds of ways they were threatened. Zum Beispiel, man bekommt SMS, wo steht, ja, wir kommen bald und de dein Leben zerstören oder deine Familie oder de deine Kinder klauen oder eine... Ja. So, you know, everything to personal attacks, receiving SMS saying, we're going to come and destroy your lives, take away your children, so really on that kind of level. Oder die Journalisten einfach sehen an eine Fassade an oder bei beim nebenstehenden Haus irgendwie Graffiti, Kritzelei mit einer Androhung. Or they'll graffiti something across from your house that you'll see when you leave uh, with a threat towards you. Yeah, also, ich hab, uh, ich hab so nach Tipp gefragt oder nach Information, uh, Glasnost Defense Foundation. Und uh, bei der Seite von dieser russischen NGO-Organisation können Sie auch viel, viel Beispiele, ich glaube, auch, auch auf Englisch lesen. So Nura has done some research and recommends, if you're interested in this and looking at further examples, checking out an organization called... Um, Glasnost Defense Foundation. Um, and she found some of these examples here and they feature a lot more along those lines. Yeah, uh, das heißt, ich habe schon über die, diese Androhungen ge gesagt, das ist die populärste Methode, uh, auf Journal uh, Journalisten beeinflussen oder einfach uh, schweigen lassen. Und uh, was noch uh, in, in diesem Jahr 2012, Russland war vor kurzem sehr sehr bekannt, ja, schrecklich bekannt, weil so viele Journalisten jedes Jahr dort getötet wurden. Und ähm, im letzten Jahr haben wir vier Opfer. Ähm, Mehrheit ist im Kaukasischen Republiken. Und äh, dass, dass es so wenig, schrecklich auch zu sagen, wenig ist, äh, sagt aber nichts über eine Demokratisierung und so weiter. Das einfach äh, benutzt man jetzt eine neue Methode, nicht einfach direkt Leute zu Mörden. So in the past, sadly, Russia has been very famous for the high number of deaths of so journalists killed. And in 2012, that number went down to four people, mainly people from the Caucasian region, Caucasus. Um, but um, that's, you know, it's, it's still a sad statistic and four is still four too many. Um, but it's also that the government has kind of learned a little bit, so instead of just killing people outright, which of course is not good for life for statistics and very visible to the world, again, they've resorted to more subversive tactics of suppressing journalists. Uh, noch ein Beispiel uh, über diese an Andro Androhung. Schwer mir auch, auch auf Deutsch auszuschreiben, uh, auszusprechen. Uh, die bekannteste Fall ist uh, von Chef oder Chef von Untersuchungsausschuss Russlands hat ein Journalist von auch sehr bekannten Novaya Gazeta zuerst eingeladen und äh, gefragt, ob der nicht sich entschuldigen will, weil ein Text hat diesem Chef von Untersuchungsausschuss nicht gefallen. Und später hat er einfach äh, ihn eingeladen, in den Wald zu gehen, wo wirklich äh, der, der, der Sergei Sakalov wirklich angegriffen wurde. Und äh, dieser Chef ist noch immer beim Dienst. So, um a very scandalous case is when the head of, um, this is like a parliamentary group, right? Untersuchungsausschuss is, uh, I think it's a committee of 
in inquiry. Inquiry. In uh, okay, so um, yes, but uh, okay, so this is going. That, um, they basically called in uh, the head of a, a, a paper who published an article that this guy didn't like. So the head of this inquiry session said, "This is I don't like this article. Uh, come in to see me." And um, and this went so far that he sort of arranged to meet this person in a wood where this person was then beaten up. Ja, the, uh, gegen Journalisten wurde auch sehr viel Strafverfahren uh, gelaufen. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I didn't want to be rude, but uh, as the time you know comes 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 to an end. Uh, Maybe one one minute. One one minute. Okay. <laughs> of course. So Please. so. Um, Natürlich gibt es ganz viele, äh, diese Gesetze, die ich genannt habe, äh, benutzt man, um, um Strafverfahren gegen Journalisten anzufangen. So these laws that were mentioned earlier are of course used to um, get, you know, file a lawsuits against journalists. Und Konsequenzen darauf, dass viele Journalisten und Blogger entscheiden, einfach aus dem Land zu gehen. Und gibt es auch Beispiele? And this is a consequence journalists are increasingly choosing to move into exile basically. Zum Beispiel äh, im Exil jetzt ist äh, eine Journalistin Palina Jerebtsova, die einfach ein Tagebuch aus Tschetschenien äh, veröffentlicht hat, so ähnlich wie irgendwann Anna Politkovska. Sie, sie lebt jetzt in Finnland und wartet auf, äh, auf äh, Asyl. So for instance one journalist Polina who basically just published a diary about her life in Chechnya um, was forced to move to Finland and is now um, yeah, filing for uh, the right to stay there because she feels she can't go back to Russia. Es gibt auch einen Blogger und Aktivist und Journalist Maxim Yefimov, der jetzt in IS Island äh, wohnt und er hat einfach Kritik an die Kirche, orthodoxische Kirche. In einem Post a blogger gemacht. that has now moved um, to um, Maxim Yefimov, uh, and he's moved to uh, orthodoxische. Uh, oh no, no, no. Well, he was criticizing the Orthodox Church, and that was enough for him to have to move into exile. Und äh, auch ein äh, Eco-Aktivist und Blogger Suren Gazarian, der auch jetzt im Exil ist, äh, weil er so aktiv war und kämpfte für die ökologische Zustand im äh, Südrussland. Oder even Bloggers writing about ecological topics. So it's not, you know, you don't have need to be critical of the government or the president or anything like that. It's enough to write critically about ecological or, or religious topics, even to, to be in that position. Und noch eine komische äh, oder es gibt auch ganz viele Fälle, dass äh, die auch in Regionen versucht man direkt äh, Journalisten beeinflussen und auch eine Nachricht auch von gestern, dass äh, russische Regierung hat vorgeschlagen äh, Blogger zu zahlen, da, damit sie ein, mehr über Patriarchismus schreiben. Das ist auch direkte Angriffe an die, ich weiß nicht, das heißt Zensur oder. There are also other kinds of attacks, if you will, because there's a you know, uh, basically the government trying to influence bloggers and journalists to write pro-regime articles and, and paying them and bribing them basically to write positively about the government. I think I need to plug. Okay, es gibt noch viel zu sagen. There's a lot more to say. Approach <laughs> Nuria, she has many more examples. Thank you, Nuria. And is also really active in this whole uh, topic herself as a journalist in Russia. So maybe we take the chance, although this was now a lot of different different uh, uh, information and, and opinion, how to get a little umbrella around it. Uh, well, Matthias, probably uh, the, the question of human rights and, and freedom of press, uh, especially, I mean, in all, all three uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the inputs uh, are strongly connected, especially in the, the, the case descriptions. It, I mean, since you're going inside, outside, inland and, and, and foreign countries, how is it to jump back and forth those described systems and uh, d d when, when, when you hear this information is that is that new to you or is that uh, is that like common practice for you when you work uh, outside of Germany well if of course, it's, it's, it's common practice. I mean, we know about all these cases, not probably on, uh, about the individual cases, because they're coming up new ones all the time. But um, of course, we know because, first of all, Reporters Without Borders themselves, they have correspondence all around the world, and there are many other organi organizations that try to monitor and document these cases. I mean, that, that's, that's what uh, 
uh, what we do and what others do. So um, in m most situations, the problem is not that we don't know about those situations. We just have we have just very very limited power to change those. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm in discussions uh, sometimes with people who suffer from these uh, situations and, and who are not activists themselves, but for example journalists. And then they say, "What can Reporters Without Borders do about this?" And I'm like, "Well, wh what do you think Reporters Without Borders can do to influence the government of Pakistan?" You know. The, the, the State Department has little influence on the government of Pakistan. What do you expect Reporters Without Borders or other activists to do? Uh, this is not like um, uh, that, that we feel uh, powerless or helpless or frustrated or anything. It's just that um, what, what organizations like ours and yours uh, can do is, is awareness raising. And then um, changes can be made, but of course it is... Uh, very, very difficult. And in some, some countries it's more difficult than in others. So it's, uh, this ends on a not even, let's say, a pessimist note, but uh, as we hear on this podium, there's a long way to go. Thank you very much for all the input. Yes, yes but have, yes, have, please, yes, go uh, ahead. Sorry about that, but one remark, because I forgot to say that after the end of my, my presentation there. Um, even though uh, you might get the impression that we're putting too much uh, emphasis on that, it's, it's not that, because we, are, we know about, um, the, let's call them the traditional threats to press freedom. We do not know enough about these new kinds of threats to press freedom. If you have information on, for example, censorship, uh, um, suppression of comments, posts, uh, tweets, and so on and so forth on the, on the internet platforms, we are really, really interested in knowing about this because that also needs to be documented very well and we need to use this to approach the companies and even to approach governments in, in some cases to um, use these examples to put pressure on them because that is something that that is uh, starting right now. I mean, that has started a couple of years ago, but it, it's not as prevalent as the threat to press freedom that we've known for hundreds of years. So if you have information like that, please approach us. Uh, there are, I mean, I myself am here, um, and then if I could ask you, I mean, it's a <laughs> probably a little embarrassing, but Christian and Hauke, could you stand up for a second? Because uh, my colleagues, the executive director of uh, Reporters Without Borders Germany is here, and also the head of our internet desk. Yes, yeah, stand up so everyone can see you because if, if you <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> um, if, if you have information like that please come to us and, and let us know thank you very much thank you very much thank you European thank you Norbert thank you Noria and thank you Matthias